Chapter 5 Legend Beckons Zale glared at Fulger, saying nothing until his stein of ale arrived. What's your business with the Grimstone? He took a mighty draught of his drink. As you might have already discerned, those who desire it are dangerous, Fulger replied. They will have what they seek at any cost. Zale half shrugged. Is this to say that they'll pay anything for it? That the reward is colossal, or is your interest of some more pious nature? Indeed, money is no obstacle for them. You didn't answer the second part of my question. Fulger gave a cool, wry smile. If you're asking if your spiritual guide is pious, then of course I must say yes. That's not what I meant. Put another way, are you playing at some scheme to convince me to go after the Grimstone so you'll have it for your purposes? Fulger's expression softened, his mouth a thin line. No schemes, Captain. As I said, I am but a guide. Let's just cut the charade and get to who you really are. All that I've told you is true, sir, but I have not told you everything. I am of the ancient order of Ether Diamond, protectors of the light of the land, and keepers of its secrets. I know nothing of this order, Sale said. How do you know I've been given any opportunity related to the Grimstone? When Vidimir offered you the job to retrieve the Grimstone back in the tavern, it was not altogether difficult for me to see and hear what was happening. He did, after all, cast dark fire upon your table. Yes, that he did. And he offered substantial reward, did he not? Zale frowned. That's a little beyond your charge, healer. Fulger raised a placating hand. Forgive me, please. Then may I ask, why not seek it? It's an adjunct of Shadow Age myth. Zale shook his head as if to shake away his doubts. We've no reason to believe the thing even exists. Fulger arched an eyebrow. You think Vidimir disingenuous, that he meant to lead you to something that isn't there, perhaps, so that you would miss the bar's deadline? That cuts reasonably close. Zale took a gulp from his stein. The Grimstone is real, Captain. It is a piece of the dark entry, broken as Zophiel used the last of her power to attack it. After that, her mortal body gave up her soul. She died in the arms of Birku Umis, the Patriarch. It was then in the year 3021 of the Fudroyant Age that the Shadow Age began. Zale sighed deeply. Ugh, so you say. But you speak in legends. I can't verify any of this in actual recorded history. It is real history. How it's recorded depends very much on the source. Much like the Grimstone, I imagine. The Grimstone existed within the Grand Trillian continent during the Shadow Age. Some in the Order believe it was here, in what is now Tuscany. Zale tried to assess whether or not this man should remain aboard his ship. He seemed to reek of ulterior motive. Your records sound inconsistent, Zale said. Vidimir claimed the Grimstone to be elsewhere. Fulger tilted his head. Can an object not move locations over millennia, Captain? Eh. Zale merely grunted in response. I believe Vidimir directed you toward Gukan, yes? Fulger asked. I don't feel quite at liberty to discuss that, Zale replied. Now that Zale thought about it, Fulger had not been that far from Vidimir's table, but he was still surprised Fulger had been able to pick up so much of their conversation. His mind lingering on the name of Gukan, Zale took another drink. There was a point at which the dark entry was under the ground, Fulger said, and the grimstone above. Our land exists by way of the divine, so it is by the light of the land that it is held together. For the land to be without the light is akin to the body breaking down from the inside, 
like an evaporation of the cellular structure within. You would cease to exist. Our land nearly succumbed to the darkness in those days, but certain heroes appeared who fought for our land and drove the grimstone away. These heroes, were they also ethereal astrals? Not astrals, Fulger replied, but they did possess etheretics, genetics passed down from the lineage of archastrals, such as Zophil, who had become mortal for the sake of our world. With their divine powers, they overcame the forces of darkness and banished the grimstone from our land. They became a chapter of legend, the heroes of their time. Zale perked, remembering his conversation with Tome Scrubber. Heroes of time. This is part of that legend? Who were these heroes? Forgive me, I do not remember all their names, but I do know they were led by one of the name... MacPherson. Zale sat upright with a jolt. He felt chilled to the bone upon hearing his own birth name. He gazed at a portside window looking to the harbor south of the Queenie's berth. On your word that it's real, you would have me go after this grimstone. I mean not to overstep my bounds, sir. You must pursue that which you are called to pursue. If you do not retrieve the Grimstone, then another might, and the dangers of this artifact in the wrong hands are unspeakable. Dangers such as... Falger sat back, seeming to consider his answer. Void energy is darkness, its very essence in opposition to ether, to light. Some would count void as among the divine etheretical energies that have entered our world over the eons, but that is wrong. Void is anything but divine. Since the Shadow Age, he continued, certain substances exist in our world which allow their users to connect with the void and channel its power. Burn, also known to some as the Dark Ethereal, is one of them. You witnessed Vidimir use this in the tavern. Zale nodded. The destructive and manipulative forces of Grimstone are much greater, Fulger said. If the Grimstone were ever reunited with the rest of the Dark Entry, we could see the land plunged into another Shadow Age, possibly one even fiercer than the first. The Dark Entry? You mean that thing still exists? Fulger returned a deadpan look. We don't know. It has never been found. Yet we also have no evidence that it was eliminated. Our strongest confirmation of the Dark Entry's presence is the Grimstone itself. Even this small fragment was not something that MacPherson and the heroes could destroy. Rather, it was cast away and hidden. A hidden object of great power. The perfect formula for a high-value catch, Zale thought. He still wasn't sure what to make of Fulger. The man seemed to have a deep understanding of this legend from a source of information Zale had never heard of. For Zale, information was like having a sharpened sword at your side. You could never go wrong by having it, and it just might come in useful. Vidimir claimed the light is weakening, that the Grimstone would help it, Zale said. Search your soul. Is it sensible that dark brightens light? Is white made brighter by black? No. They are not compatible. One must overpower the other. It is not to help the light, it is to replace it. If someone strong enough controls the grimstone, with its power can the entire land be transformed for the sole purpose of serving masters of the void, such as the Umbramancers of old. Perhaps you can see how grim is a good descriptor for this object. You do paint a rather bleak picture, Zale agreed. And yet, there is an element of fate which is hard to ignore. These heroes I spoke of, it was Augustus MacPherson, your ancestor, who took the greatest measures to safeguard it from ever falling into the wrong hands. Having befriended a Grimkin shaman, 
he underwent a sacred ritual with the gribstone, fusing his own blood with the object so that only he or one of his bloodline could again claim the grimstone and free it from its hidden sanctum. Zale turned away from the window. The bloodline of MacPherson? Indeed, Captain. For you, of course. This makes the grimstone more than a mere bounty. It is nearly a birthright. You are the namesake of MacPherson, are you not? How do you know that? Sale shot back. He'd already had his fill of strangers inexplicably knowing the details of his personal business. I am of the order, sir, Fulger said calmly. Our records are more complete than even those of your guilders. Ha! <laughs> Sale boomed in triumph. If all this talk of bloodline is true, then why should I rush to retrieve this thing? I'm the only one who can. If that is the only way, and there might yet be other powers which can break it, heed closely what I said. MacPherson's bloodline. Not merely Zale MacPherson. That brought Murdoch's face from flushed to blanched. You imply my family as well. Fulger nodded. It could be that no others know of this, but should others who seek the Grimstone eventually make these connections, then not only you but your children and grandchildren and all in your line are in certain danger. Zale was gripped by sudden anger at his short-sighted ancestor. How could he not know the danger heaped upon his descendants? Then another thought rattled him. Has anyone else made this connection with my family? Vidimir? He looked Fulger over. Why would you want me to retrieve it anyway? With the bloodline lock removed and my brood absolved, I would just bring it to Vidimir for the payoff. I owe that to my crew. Your order and the kingdom can sort out the rest of this legendary gibberish. That is not my concern. Just so, Captain. Even simply releasing the Grimstone from its ancient hiding place in Gukan would count as a success to the Order. No one can ascertain the intentions of that nation, which is in itself unsettling. <laughs> Zale puffed a derisive laugh. If it's as powerful as you say, there are those who might say it's even more dangerous in my hands than Vidimir's. Does this not concern you? Fulger took a moment to answer. I think not. And why is that? I believe you are a good, honorable man, a family man, with a good heart and a good soul. Zale scowled at the notion that Fulger presumed to know him. Let's be clear, healer. I am no hero. I don't save damsels in distress. I don't rescue helpless furry little anthropods from oppression. I retrieve unique and valuable cargoes for this kingdom, and I bring them to the buyer for payment. We ask no questions, we question no motives. We expect only to be handsomely paid for our services, no more, no less. As you say, Captain. Zale scratched at his chin. Perhaps it's Ingukan. But that's an entire country, not much of a lead. Fulger briefly felt inside his coat. I believe I can help with that, Captain, and perhaps achieve a more targeted search. Zale heard loud shuffles and shouts from the decks outside. It was a subtle shift in the bustle of readying the ship. This was more frantic, disturbed. A strange flash reflected in the port side window panes. Zale strode toward starboard and looked out to the north. Fulger joined him. A sloop, several berths away, erupted into flame. It was not just fire. It was purple fire. Dark fire. Hell's fury, Zale growled. It's coming this way. Fulger's eyes were wide, his mouth half open. This is a most disconcerting development. Zale snatched up his hat and made for the door. It would seem, healer, that your legend has come to taunt us. Jensen skidded into such an abrupt stop that he almost slipped right over the starboard taffrail. 
The eerie purple flames were only about four berths removed from the Queenie, eating their way through the docks at an alarming rate. Stalina, he gasped. We need to get you out of sight. He spotted some sailcloth stowed against the inner railing. He grabbed it, unrolling part of the large cloth as he ran. Stay under this until I come back for you. He flung the sail over her and urged her to the deck before she could protest beyond a stifled yelp. Jensen stood up straight and looked around. He smoothed out his shirt, both thankful and surprised that no one had taken notice. Men! barked Captain Murdoch down on the main deck. Make for the waves! He nodded to his first mate. Dippy rang the bell. Cast moorings and weigh anchor! He bellowed. Ready the sweeps and shove off the dock! Aye, on the mooring, sir, Casper replied, grabbing two men to assist. A merchant cog two berths away exploded, shooting purple fireballs and inflamed timbers into the air. Jensen tumbled halfway down the staircase to the quarterdeck. The blast and sudden swells in the water bounced to the Queenie violently. Jensen pulled himself up by the rail and glanced overboard. Flaming debris from the explosion landed upon the berth beside them. The hungry flames spread instantly to the planks of the dock. Very soon the fire would reach the Queenie. Sir, Jensen pointed, there might not be time to cast off. Casper and Dippy both ran to the starboard rail. Fire's coming this way, shouted Casper. Hack the moorings, ordered the captain. I'll take care of the headline, said Yancey, pulling an axe as though from nowhere. Their quartermaster had the placement of hidden objects on the ship down to an art. I'll take the stern. Felger ran nimbly up the stairs past Jensen. Jensen was surprised the physiker had volunteered to cut a dock line. That'll take more than a scalpel, Casper called as Fulger passed. Upon the after deck, Fulger drew something from within his coat and swung. The rope was thicker than a man's arm, yet one swing was all it took. There was a flash of white, and the line was free. Jensen stared with mouth agape. Time to shut off, Captain Murdoch roared. Keep a wary eye on the fire. Fire, you call it, Jensen said with a shiver. I've never seen fire like this before. The captain looked back at him just as the bell rang out again. All oarsmen at the ready, Dippy called. That included Jensen. He started for the stairs. Beep, yelled Murdoch. Lock the wheel and center the rudder. Stand ready to jibe hard to larboard as soon as we're clear of the dock. Aye, sir. Casper headed for the helm on quarterdeck. Jensen was nearly bowled over as he made his way down the stairs to the inner deck. Already, Yvette and her crewmates had the oars positioned and ready to extend outside the boat. To his horror, he saw that the flames had already made their way around the dock, past the ship's bow and now at port side. Jensen, along with several others, stumbled his way to a bench and grabbed an oar. Another crewmate sat next to him to assist. Jackson was somewhere behind him, his airy voice shouting over and over, Don't touch the fire, man! Don't touch the fire! Everyone to larboard! Yvette cried out. Find a part of the deck that isn't burning! Almost all of it is burning! Someone shouted. Ready! Yvette called. Push! The crew gave a mighty shove into the dock. It was mighty enough, in fact, that the remainder of the dock gave way and several of the oars pushed right through into the inferno. When they emerged, flames engulfed them, as if they had just been dipped into burning pitch. Give way together! Yvette shouted. Oars in the water! Now! Pull! They brought the oars down, heaving to move the ship forward. Jensen was horrified to see that mere water was not enough to quench the purple flames. Pull! screamed Yvette. One of the oars snapped. The two rowers fell from their benches at the sudden loss of drag. It's on the boat! cried a deckhand. Fire of the dead man! Jackson gasped. It'll bring us all straight to ghoul! Another deckhand, Clement, slapped Jackson across the arm. Shut up and row, fool! Grunts of strain and anguish filled the deck as they tried to row. Seconds later, another inflamed oar snapped just above the blade. Yvette shook her head in dismay. It's no good. We're tangled up in the debris and losing oars fast. 
Find a way to douse those flames, Dippy bellowed from above. Man the pump! Feeling increasingly helpless, Jensen gave his all on the oar. He heard a sickening crack, and splinters erupted outside. The oar shaft flew forward and whacked him in the forehead. He fell, and the back of his head slammed into the bench behind him. Then he felt nothing as a deep, dark calm swept away his vision. Zale pointed at the purple flames, which now dared to touch his ship. Keep spraying the hull, he roared. Deckhands Redvers, Owen, and Bert manned the ship's pump, normally reserved for bringing water to clean the deck. Now they used it to hose down the outer hull. Murdoch remained in utter disbelief over their state of affairs. Before, a few days earlier, he had never even heard of dark fire. Now it was consuming everything in the Warfonia harbor. The water's freezing on contact! Casper gestured wildly over the railing. And the flames are still spreading! A plume of violet flame whipped over the larboard beam. Deccans Sal and Elihu screamed and fell, their arms caught by the flames. Steam rolled from their arms, and any skin the flames had touched turned a frigid white. It was not steam from something hot, but rather the condensed air that surrounded extreme cold. Wind accompanied the flames like a winter blast. Fulger was upon Sal and Elihu in a flash. He pulled something small from within his coat like a thorn and jabbed each of their arms. A faint, brief, orange glow spread from the site of impact through their frostbite cold extremities, slightly restoring their natural color. Get these men below, he shouted to the nearest deckhand. He drew what appeared to be a long dagger or short sword, double-edged and tapered to a sharp point. Its blade was black, with tiny sparkles like stars in a night sky. Soft white light, like ring glow, emanated from every angle and edge of the blade. Zale stared in wonderment. Yet another surprise from their new healer. Fulger reached over the railing and swung the blade back and forth in quick, short strokes. Its glow intensified and extended beyond the weapon's tip, like a mini lighthouse emitting a white beam out to sea. He aimed it at the nearest of the chilly inferno. The flames actually receded. Captain, Fulger shouted, I can buy us but a little time. But the dark fire, it consumes with a will. Zale chanced to look over portside. Fulger was right. This was not the combustion that fires normally destroy with. In these flames was a strange, monstrous hunger. What it consumed, it simply ate away, leaving its deathly chill. Zale's breath escaped as steam. The water below the dock was turning to ice. He backed up to midship, taking in his surroundings. He felt the natural wind in his face, knowing it fondly over the frigid gusts of the dark fire. It was blowing eastward, perhaps a point or two east-northeast, bow to stern. He inhaled, nodding to himself. It was now or never. Fall back the sail! The wind favors us, men! Beep! Stay ready at the helm! Yancey smirked. Sailing backwards, Captain? Work your magic, Fump. Tail her out like we did back in the Whitelin Hall. Yancey rolled up his sleeves and bit down on the blade of a dirk. Aye! He growled through his teeth. The rudder might not hold, Captain, said Dippy, watching as Yancey took to the rigging with crewmates Ian and Rowan. A small price to get us out of here, Dip. Zale replied. Yvette, how many good oars have we left? He called to the lower deck. A few moments passed. Eight, Captain. We've lost four to the flames. Zale turned to Dippy. Get four up here to stern. Be ready to punch into the water behind the ship on larboard to give our rudder support. Yvette, all remaining oarsmen to starboard. We'll come hard about, lads. Captain, shouted Fulger. We must make our move! Thump! Zale shouted. All set, Captain! Drop the sail and haul the braces! At long last, the ship started moving. 
Back at the helm, Casper held tight to the wheel as it wobbled awkwardly against its lock. Steady! Prepare to bring her about! Zale bellowed. All's at the ready, Captain! Dippy shouted from the stern. Ready to hard port, sir! cried Casper. Starboard oars ready, Captain! called Yvette. Ready on the sail yard! yelled Yancey from the larboard brace. Zale watched. Waiting. Waiting. Until finally. The prow was clear of the dock. All hands heave! he roared. Like clockwork, every member of the crew performed their role in perfect unison. Most who didn't hold to something fell to the deck as the ship turned hard around, creaking all the way. Already they felt the relief of the warm, late Jovidor air sweeping the ship. Quarter turn to the right ought to do it, Sale said, mostly to himself. Once satisfied, he called, Come about! Oars to port! Yvette bellowed. Resetting the yard! shouted Yancey, pulling forward on port side. Starboard, full back! he yelled to his mate across the ship. Zale felt a rise of anxiety. The ship was not slowing enough. The last thing he wanted was to inadvertently spin right back into the dock. Look alive, you grog guzzling vermin! Pull those oars port side and steadier! Pull to the blood! Finally, the ship steadied and they faced away from the harbor. Cheers erupted all over the ship. We're not out of this yet, yelled Rosh, who had been helping with the yard braces. Indeed, purple flames still licked at the hull of the ship. Fulger worked to contain them with his bizarre weapon, but they spread faster than he could put them out. Zale heard a shriek from below that could only have come from Wigglebelly. Get those infernal fires off my ship, Zale ordered, his voice getting a bit hoarse. Hack off the boards, if it comes to that. Without tarry, several men took hold of ropes and chopped off the chunks of the ship's hull that Fulger could not relieve of dark fire. Dippy and three deckhands ran their oars back to the deck below to help stabilize their course and make headway. Thump, said Zale. Let's get that sail reset. Capital work, sir. Doing what I can with what I've got, Captain. On it. Beep! Zale called to his bosun. Yeah! Casper answered from the helm. Make use of this easterly wind and steer us to blue water. How's the rudder? Seems to be holding, sir! Zale thought they might finally be in the clear. Then, as if fate needed a good laugh, a shard of purple inflamed wood flew into the air directly into the sail. It caught like a dry straw as men screamed in shock. Fulger leaped upon the rigging and doused the fire with the soft white glow of his blade, although not before the fire had left a gaping hole in the sail. Miraculously, the mast, ropes, and rigging all escaped unscathed. Fump groaned, I'll get the spare sail. Admirable teamwork, crew, Zale shouted. All of you worthy to be Murdoch's mates. Once we're trimmed out and underway, officers to my cabin. You too, Fulger. Beep, steer us away from the harbor as fast as you can. I've had enough of docks for one day. I sir, I couldn't agree more. With that, Zale removed his hat, wiped his brow, and entered his cabin. Tonight's events had jostled Zale to the core. Some time after they turned the ship away from the dock, he had made a decision. Now he mulled it over quietly, allowing his officers the brief respite of conversation. Following their roaring send-off, he felt obliged to let the men crack open enough rations of ale and wine to calm the crew. Never to the point of inebriation, however. Zale's tolerance for drunken sailors during an active expedition had been made clear. Anyone careless enough to become inhibited would be roped naked to the prow until the sea spray rid them of their stupor. And this was going to be an easy voyage, Rosh mumbled. Chim, if it were too easy, it wouldn't be a Murdoch voyage, Yancey said. 
Do all your jobs start with this much excitement? asked Yvette. Only the good ones. Casper took a large gulp from his mug. Rosh, the teetotal oddball of the crew, lifted his glass of water. His abstinent lifestyle kept him not only from alcohol, but also tea and coffee, and basically anything with flavor. Highest marks to the captain for leading us out of that inferno. Yeah! <laughs> cheered the others with a clink of glasses. The violet hellstorm still flared in the distance, all too visible through the stern windows. Zale stood from his chair and pulled the window shades, one by one, until the nightmarish sight was obscured. No looking back, he spoke gruffly. Too many fine vessels ruined tonight, none of which we can afford to have on our consciences. If we hadn't already been there with a full and capable crew, the Queenie'd be one of them. Zale walked back to his chair. Quick status update, please. I've got men on the sail now. Yancey replied. They'll have her hoisted in no time. And by no time, I mean a little time. We're sweeping ahead, slow and steady, Yvette said. One man, Jensen, I'm told, was knocked unconscious after his oar broke. Zale made a conspicuous eye roll. Of course he was. Where is he now? Once we cleared the dock, I had him carried to his hammock. We couldn't be bothered with it before then, she replied. If it pleases you, sir, I'll give him an elixir to ease any aches he might have upon waking, said Fulger in his gentle voice. Fine, said Zale. We didn't have to shoot anyone, Rosh put in, so I don't have much to report. I'll make sure the machetes and axes we use to hack the hull are nice and sharp next time we need to attack our own ship. I'm sure Fump will have that repaired in short order, Zale said. You know me, Fump replied. I'm a perfectionist. I'll oversee that work myself to make sure it's good and solid. Casper stroked at his long beard. Course set northward for Vatu, Captain. With Jensen down, I have Tate currently at the helm. And you, Fulger, Zale said. How do you explain this weapon of yours? Everyone stared at Fulger. It was now openly clear that he was more than he had originally purported to be. It is a Novidian analase, a long triangular sort of dagger, the healer answered simply. Zale eyed him sharply. He'd expected more of an explanation than that, and he was certain Fulger knew it. How does a healer come to have such as this? Fulger smiled, looking almost amused. Let us say, Captain, that it is in my grasp by virtue of birthright. Zale's mind was made up. The captain stood and paced the semicircular end of his cabin. He felt his officer's eyes on him. Men, in light of recent events and information, I've come to a decision. They all set their drinks down. Now he knew he had their rapt attention. Casper? We will require a slight change in course. Their eyes became like saucers, all but Fulger's, with his ingratiating tranquility. Zale was placing a lot of stock into the words of this man, but every instinct within him rang clear. His thoughts lingered on the object that was intensely desired by the kingdom's elite, the object his greatest rival hoped to shame him with, the object of unspeakable power. The object, the birthright, that he was uniquely positioned to acquire. He was certain, and he spoke without the slightest hint of doubt. We're going after the Grimstone, 